Okay, we had to take it from the top on this one. We are restarting it with the um, one minute countdown this time. So hopefully this should work a little bit better for us. Okay, and that is the timer. Give me 10 more seconds just to update the thumbnail on the new stream, and then we are going to get things started. Hopefully, this is now working a little bit better for you guys as we click over to the old profit tracker to get things started. Okay, okay, okay. If you are in the chat and following along, let me know if it's working for you, if it's coming through clearly now, and if it is good to go after the little technical difficulty that we had at the top right there. Okay, 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 here we go. Let me check it on my end really quickly because I know there's always a little bit of a uh, little bit of a delay when I try to ask for some feedback, but it looks like Twitch is up and live. And it looks like if I go to the YouTube side of things, it is also up and live. So we are going to get things started. And again, if anyone has some additional confirmation in the chat, you know, feel free to uh, let me know. I'm kind of going in blind here. But it does look like the YouTube one is frozen on the timer. How are we going to fix that? Okay, here we go. I think things are looking a little bit better. We are going to get things going. I think at the very least they're working on Twitch. Let me check on Twitch to see if that's working. Apologies for the, uh, for the technical difficulties at the beginning right here. All right, I think we're just working with a little bit bigger of a delay than normal, but we are going to get things going. So... Uh, taking it from the top, objectively, we had a very, very good week last week. Uh, we took home a profit of $9,560, a 5.86% return, which crushed the S&P 500. We outperformed by 2.04%. Now, the big question, though, is, you know, this is a great week, but the only reason we had this great week is because the first week of December was not too good to us, where we lost about $12,000 off the bat right there, which is, you know, one of our worst weeks on the year if we go to our year-to-date summary. And take a peek at that. You know, it was the 48th ranked uh, week on the year. I think we only had one week worse back in May when we were a little bit on the riskier side of things. But uh, you know, this is just kind of what happens sometimes, right? But the important thing is that we've left ourselves some room to uh, to rebound and improve going forward and recollect some of those losses. And that's exactly what we did last week, right? So we're not probably not going to get it all back at one point. I think there was a point in time on Wednesday where we actually were green for the month of December, but things fell back. That's just how the stock market works, right? Things go up, things go down. We're going to put our strategy into play. We're going to follow the process that we have uh, laid out for the HT wheel, and we are going to let these things play out as they may, and that is exactly what we're doing so far, right? So I guess taking it from the top, the best thing that we did this week is we finally closed out our Rocket Lab position uh, for a 10 cent debit. And this is one where, you know, we sold 7.5 strike puts and the stock itself was trading at about 12 or 13 bucks a share. So, I mean, if you look at it objectively, would we have collected the last, I don't know, $1,000 on this over the next six weeks or so? I think definitely. But, 
You never know. It's a space company. If they have some sort of really bad event that came up or something like that and it tanked down below 7.5, I don't think I would ever forgive myself for not taking the 10 cent debit to close when we had it. Now, we opened these a long time ago. And I mean, maybe not too long. I think September, the beginning of September is when we opened these. And they were originally opened for about an 85 cent debit, meaning that we took home overall on the trade. Uh, just This is just to do the math right here. About $7,500 for us. And these are some trades where, you know, if you look at this, I like this one a lot because Rocket Lab 1 was trading at about 14 or 15 bucks a share at the time that we opened it. So we pretty much set ourselves up in a position where, in plain English, as long as the stock didn't drop 50% in the next three months, we were going to make money and we were going to make a very good amount of money, right? Because fully cash secured, uh, this position was about $66,000. But one of the great things that we could do with our margin privileges, and anyone with a margin account can do this for something that's very far out of the money, longer dated and a smaller strike, uh, is it didn't take anywhere near $66,000 for me to hold this position. So what I did was I was able to open 100 of them. It only took $15,000 of margin and basically had a position sitting in the background that took $15,000 of margin, returned me about $7,500. So it was basically a 50% return on capital over the last three months on a position that was really, really high percentage because remember, anything above 7.5 was gonna be max profit for us. And uh, it never even dipped below 11 or 12 at any point during uh, the time that we held on to this position. And, you know, positions like this, UWMC as well, it didn't go as well for us. But, you know, we opened this one for a 1.1 credit. So we're still going to make money overall. But I love the idea of having one or two positions at the top of our portfolio that are a little bit longer term, right? Maybe three, four months out and just casually collecting money week by week by week. Because if we look back at our profit tracker, right? Uh, even though the week of 1128 was really, really bad for us, we still had these two UWMC Rocket Lab pulling $2,000 of profit. If we go back the week before that, they were pulling $1,100 of profit. The week before that, there was a slight loss, but you know the idea, there we go again, $800 of profit for that week from those, $700 this week. The idea is you set these decently far out of the money. You know, you try to identify a stock that's a really, really solid value and something that if we got assigned on, we'd be thrilled to be assigned on it. And then you sell just a pretty large lot. And again, we're not going to try to sell more than what our account can hold, right? Even fully cash secured, this Rocket Lab position was about a third of our account. So, you know, if shit hit, did hit the fan, so to speak, and we did have to take assignment, we would be stuck with a position that's about half of our account, which is not bad at all. So again, that's a, some of the basic principles we want to follow as we try to identify a couple more trades like this. And again, I, I'm scrolling further up just to prove the point here. But again, you know, 1750 a profit off this. And that alone pretty much powered us to a profitable week that week that we're looking at, you know, another $1,200 of profit. So if we get one or two of these uh, positions that are sold decently far out of the money on a stock that we identify as a very good value opportunity, uh, and have low margin requirements, we let those just sit in the background and decay as time passes. I think those are some really, really good value uh, on a week to week basis when combined with the other more active positions that we have in our portfolio. And again, what we say so often about our strategy is that it's great because you can be as involved or as uninvolved as you would like. And for example, if you you know, were following us in September and only opened the UWMC and the Rocket Lab positions, you would have made about let's see, uh, $10,000 off those in just three months. And that's off maybe, I think it took maybe two minutes of actual trading to open those up and you just sit back and wait for three months. So obviously the value is identifying that opportunity up front, putting it into play and then sitting back. So I guess point being, as I, as I talk about the conclusion of the Rocket Lab and UWMC trades, is that over the next week or two, I'm really gonna be putting some effort in to try to find what I'll call the next Rocket Lab, right? A company where IV is decently high, so there's some decent extrinsic value on the leaps, the margin requirement is low, and it's trading at a nice discount or I can get some decent premium at a strike where I believe I'd be thrilled to be assigned at. So that's something I'm gonna be spending some time on. I'll probably dedicate uh, my own little video to it as opposed to just briefly mentioning it on the stream or in the Discord. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to the next one of these we have because Rocket Lab was an absolute home run. It was our best trade of the year and we took home just under $10,000 on that one. So I guess going back to the purpose of this is our weekly recap. We closed out of that one. That one reaches conclusion. We're gonna to try to find a similar one at some point in the future, but uh, don't know what it is as of right this second, so just keep your eyes peeled for that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, moving down the list here. BRPM is kind of settling down in this low tens area. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I was surprised by that, 
But, uh, you know, it's one of those things. The upside is definitely still there because the merger is approaching at some point in Q1 2021. Uh, there's still very limited downside from here. If this is a position that you're not in, it's definitely one that I would uh, take a look at because much more limited downside at this point as compared to when we entered at about 1080. I might increase my position here in the upcoming week if it gets back down to about 1015 a share because that would put my average price at about 1040 and we would really need you know a very limited spike to turn that one into a green position. And again, you know, relatively small percentage of my account fully cash secured. So I don't think there's anything wrong with bumping the position size uh, from 5.85% of my account up to about, you know, 11 ish percent of my account for this upcoming week. SCAH is one that, you know, didn't go exactly the way we wanted to last week, but I still believe in the idea that we had when we set up the trade, right? So this was the first week, excuse me, the first week that we entered into this uh, was two weeks ago, right? So we bought the shares at 1057. We sold 11 strike calls for 30 cents a piece, which means that our basis in the shares is going to be 1027. Well, you know, the shares are down to 1017. So we've lost about 10 cents a share on it, uh, but we still have some residual value on the covered calls that we're just going to let sit. The merger is, I think at some point late December, potentially. So the idea right now is we sold these 11 strike calls because there was some volatility that gave those premium. Uh, but, you know, we only do that because there's a price floor pre-merger on the SPAC of about 10 bucks a share. And we could pull the SEAH chart up so we're not just blankly staring at my profit tracker right here. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. And we had a little bit of excitement if we pull up the five-day chart where it ran up. Uh, maybe I need the 10-day chart. Where did it go? Yeah, we had a little bit of excitement back uh, last week, excuse me, two weeks ago when it ran up to past 11 uh, after hours and settled back down to 10, 17, you know, kind of lame. But if we zoom this out even further, uh, we'll know that we have a decent-ish price floor at around $10 a share. So even from 1017 here, there's very limited downside. If it pops back up to this 1075 level pre-merger, all the better, right? We just know that our break-even price is 1027. And again, if it stays below 1027, we're still going to exit the trade. It's okay if we lose a trade, right? We're not going to win every single trade. But the point is, I think the idea that we had behind the trade was sound. We put the numbers in our favor. And as long as we continue to do that, we're not going to win 100% of our trades, but we're going to make money in the long run. And that's what we're going for. So that's the story with SEAH. When, as you can see, if I've scrolled down here, we've rolled that one into the following week. Uh, Palantir finally went up, but, you know, in typical Palantir fashion for us lately, it went up about as disappointingly as possible, right? So it did start the week at 1855, went up to 1894 objectively we made about 920 bucks on that position but you know if we pull the chart up here we'll see that uh let's go back to the 10 day here it was flirting with 20 bucks a share uh last wednesday after hours and we thought okay this is perfect you know we sold the 20 straddle these are gonna hit max profit and basically it dropping from 20 down to 19 at the end of the week is essentially a two thousand dollar difference in our account but you know we're gonna keep playing the HT wheel strategy on this one week after week after week. You know, we've rolled our puts into December 17th. I haven't updated this quite yet. And then we're going to wait to sell 20 strike calls. We did this last week because we felt that Palantir was a little bit oversold. And then it popped back up and we were able to sell some covered calls. I feel similarly about it this week. If we go back to the 180 day chart here, uh, you'll see RSI is still a little bit below 50. So somewhat oversold. But I think more importantly, is the fact that this support that we see back in May as we're looking at that chart, it bounced off that pretty cleanly, uh, you know, a, about a week ago on December 6th. So I'm liking this area as a potential base. And if we do start to rebound from here, remembering the fact that, look, even, even back at the beginning of November, this thing was pushing $30 a share. So, and our break-even price is right in this, you know, 22-ish range right now. So it doesn't take much of a rebound for us to, you know, come back profitable on this. And as of right now, this is our biggest loser because we started playing this thing at 24 after the big initial candle. Uh, and you'll see that we got a break even down to 2282. And you're going to see, excuse me, 2237 at the lowest. And you're going to see this. And we did have a question, I think, in our Discord server because our break even price pops back up to 24.1. And the question is, you know, why did our break even price go up, right? If we're using the H2 wheel, isn't our break even price consistently going to be going down? And the answer is because we rolled from these 22 strike puts that we were previously selling down to 20 strike puts. So we sacrificed about $2 via strike on that one. So if Palantir does come back up to about 20 a share this Friday, 
we're going to roll back into the 22. That'll be a direct $2 reduction to our break-even price uh, combined with any covered calls that we sell. And if we get back up near 20, I think, by the end of the week, we're going to be able to have this break-even price at about 2150 ish I want to say, which is, you know, obviously not quite where the stock is, but taking everything into consideration, you know, the fact that this thing was up near 30 bucks a share back at the beginning of November, you know, considering the fact that we entered the trade itself uh, on November 9th for about 24.80, and it has since dropped 24% on us, the fact that we could get our break-even price down to about 21.50-ish uh, in the next week or so, I think is a huge, huge win for us. So we're going to keep an eye on that and just hang tight as we let that trade work itself out, right? When you have a stock drop 23.63%, you know, I know we're used to winning a vast majority of the trades that we make in here, uh, but, you know, you just have to be patient with these, right? And it's frustrating because, you know, we've lost $6,000 on this trade as it currently stands. And that's definitely weighing down our profits on a week-to-week -week basis. But the idea is, you know, when we take, when we have losses, they're really temporary losses, right? We have positions like what we did with Stitch Fix, what we did with Chewy, what we did with, I mean, SoFi, Stitch Fix, Chewy, Roku this week. You know, that's a thousand bucks a profit. And when we take that profit, that's it. That trade is over. We've locked in a thousand bucks a profit. And now in previous weeks, it might seem a little bit depressed because, you know, even though we locked in 220 on Zillow, 170, $400 a profit, maybe 600 with what we have with AT&T, you know, we did lose 4,800 bucks on Palantir. But just because that's depressing our week to week profits, remembering that we banked about $600 a profit here, we banked about, you know, another $1,100 a profit here. Once this Palantir trade finally turns around, all of that is going to start coming together. We're going to all these past losses that were weighing down our profits on a week-to-week -week basis, again, those are only temporary losses, and those will flow through as gains uh, in the upcoming weeks, provided we get this thing back to break even. And honestly, I mean, let's think about this thing, right? You might say, oh, what if it keeps going down? What if it keeps going down? Uh, the important thing is just to be patient with this one, right? It's December 12th. We entered into this thing on November the 9th, and we've already got our break-even price from 24.8, where you know the trade began at. Uh, down to what will be about 2150 when we decide to roll this put back up to a 22 strike. So the fact that in just one month we've gotten our break even price from 248 uh, down to 215 and over three dollar reduction, what does that tell you about the next month, two month, three months, even just next year if we have to keep sticking with this one? Uh, I think there's enough I mean there's not a ton of extrinsic value left on these things, especially as it starts to get away from our break even price a little bit. But I do think we can expect a little bit of a rebound in the short term. And month over month, we can keep dropping that break-even price. The one thing that can't go down forever, though, is the price of the stock. And eventually, the idea is that someday they will catch up. This may be one of the more annoying ones where this list gets a little bit longer on us. But, you know, that happens sometimes, right? I think we have our uh, GHIV trade breakout that we have right here. And this is one where the list got super, super long. This was the SPAC that turned into UWMC, and we were in a position where, hey, uh, we entered into this thing at 1084. It ended up at 950. So overall, that's a 12.36% drop. But this is one that we started in uh, December 9th of last year, and it took us until June of the following year uh, to wrap that trade up. And while that is a six-month period, you know, in the scheme of things, from an investing perspective, six months really isn't that long. Uh, but at the same time, through all of these trades and rolls and selling of covered calls and running the HT wheel, uh, we actually turned a stock that dropped 12.36% on us into a gain of over $11,000, which is, you know, on $22,000 of capital is a 49% return on capital. And annualized, even over a six-month period, is still over 100%, which is a number that we love to see. So point being, you know, we have these tabs hidden in here to just kind of point to the fact that, you know, this isn't the first time that this has happened. We understand a lot of people are new to following us, and this might be one of the first ones that's really moved against you uh, in a big way, but there is no need to panic. This has happened before. We've pulled it out before, and I think everything is going to be okay with Palantir. We're, again, we're just one month into this thing. Solid company, decent revenues. And I'm perfectly happy to keep playing this one down month after month after month, remembering we've got this break-even price down three bucks in one month, you know, looking forward four or five, even if we just get it down one or two dollars a month for the next five months, uh, we'll have this thing down to about 16, 15 a share break-even by summertime. So 
Not too worried about this. It's going to rebound. We got P Dog 1967 giving his well wishes to Palantir. He says it's a good stock. I think it's a good stock. And we are going to hang tight with the HD wheel process. Uh, for those of you in the Discord server, this would have been a great time to pull up that trust the process gift that we love to use so much. But uh, I don't know how to make that pop up on the stream. So I'll, I'll start to work on that at some point. Uh, but going back to last week again, these were trades that were very, very green. Palantir were rolling to the next week. DraftKings were going to roll to the next week. We made 2400 back on that. But again, you know, I want to caveat with the fact that we only made that much because we lost so much up front. But that's just how this works, right? I think it'd be dishonest if I sat this in front of you and said, oh, we made 10000 bucks last week. This is great. You know, we want to look at our results holistically. And right now, my goal is to get December green. So right now we've lost about a couple thousand dollars in December, but let's take a look at what we have for the upcoming week, right? It's all of these positions. We've got Palantir, we've got DraftKings, we've got Corsair that we're rolling into the following week. And again, how hard would it be to get back even in December? And let's just assume everything stays flat for the upcoming week, right? This is the best way that we know of or that we like to say that we test what we're holding for the upcoming week in the market, right? So this would go to zero. We would get that money. Uh, Palantir, if we sold some covered calls, we haven't done that yet, so I don't want to count those profits before they've uh, before they've hatched, so to speak. But this would go down to 1.06 if Palantir just didn't move. Uh, if DraftKings didn't move, what did DraftKings close at? DraftKings closed at 30.41. Uh, so these would be worth about $1.50. We'd get that back. Moving down the list here, what did Corsair close at? Corsair closed at 21.17, so these would be worth about a buck 40, so not a ton of extrinsic left on those puppies. But hey, Fubo's above 17. That would be max profit. This would be max profit. This would be max profit. And all of a sudden, just from zero movement at all in the market, uh, that's $2,000 of profits. And all of a sudden, there you go. We're basically back to break even in December. So despite how horrifically some things moved against us, and we haven't even really talked in too much detail about DraftKings because that one moved against us very very hard right you see that 15 percent, and that's an even shorter of a time frame right two weeks on the dot uh so that one kind of sucks so having palantir and DraftKings, two larger positions which we felt were safer because i was a fan of the stock so we scaled in a little bit and got kind of burned but the fact that those have moved you know palantir 20 percent plus drop on us DraftKings 15 ish percent drop on us uh the fact that we're flirting with breaking even potentially on those in the near future and breaking even in december overall uh, just in the upcoming week, I think is a testament to the strategy. And we still are going to have, even after next week, two more weeks to go in December. And again, I, I always like to hang my hat on the fact that we haven't lost money a single month so far in 2021. Uh, but in the same vein as us saying that, you know, it's dishonest to talk about this without talking about it in the context of this, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about the brief red amount that we have in December so far, because if you take a look at that in the context of the, you know, rest of 2021 that we've had, we're still at a three-digit return from a percent pers uh, perspective overall. And I think that's awesome. We're going to try to close above three digits at the end of the year. I think my one short-term goal, it's always good to have short, long-term goals. Uh, short-term goal is to get this back to green so we could say we made money every single month uh, in 2021. And then just keep moving on, you know, starting with getting back even on Palantir, getting back even on DraftKings. And again, if you're not in those positions and you're hearing us talk about these because we're already halfway through, you know, the H2 wheel cycle, so to speak, on a lot of these, uh, the fact that they're down so much right now and we're fans of the stock, it would be a great opportunity to jump in. For example, if you're not in on Palantir yet, we identified that there was decent support at that 18 level if you wanted to sell 18 strike puts for the upcoming week. There you go. You've got a 1.10% ROR. That is above that 1% weekly ROR number that we like to target. And I think that's a great entry point at this point in time for that uh, for that stock. So that's something that I think would be interesting for the upcoming week. Even DraftKings, right? We're in here with a little bit higher of a basis. But if you pop open this one, uh, you could get that 1% ROR down at, you know, 1.68% ROR down at a 29 strike. And this is one that's saying there's only going to be about a 134 move, which would put it down pretty much the low end of that expected range to 29 on the dot. So I think that's some solid value as well if you are not already in uh, on those two positions. But again, going back to DraftKings, I think that's really the only bigger one, excuse me, that we're rolling over that I haven't talked about. What we did for that one uh, was we, you know, you'll notice with things like CRISPR, you know, we rolled from 83 to 83 to 83 to 83 just because I wanted to keep that upside. Uh, for DraftKings, you know, it's been slipping a decent amount. I wanted to do something to lower my break even a little bit better. And we were looking really, really nice on DraftKings for a second. 
uh, because it got back above our 33 strike and we were almost going to hit max profit on the trade, which would be awesome. But, you know, stocks go up, stocks go back down, whatever happens on a week to week basis, that's okay because we're prepared for it. And again, looking at this thing in the context of the last 180 days uh, from this peak back in September at 65, I mean, it really hasn't had too much of a rebound except for from 28 to 34 down here. Uh, but with this rebound, I would expect it to level out a little bit, right? And this does look similar if you want to look at chart patterns. This big, big drop up and back down looks pretty similar to back here uh, in July. Big drop up, excuse me, excuse me, back here in May where there's a big drop up, back down, and then it, you know, levels out as it made a run for the upcoming month. And this is from, you know, 43 back up to 55. That's a 12-ish dollar run on the stock. All we need is a dollar fifty run on the stock. We just needed to get back to thirty-two uh, to get out of this position for roughly even money, right? So we've got this position open. I should probably highlight a yellow to indicate that. But again, if DraftKings probably better illustrate this if I just typed in thirty-two. If DraftKings gets back up to thirty-two, uh, yes, we're not going to make a ton of money on this, right? We'll only make seventy bucks. But the fact that we could break even on this thing after having it drop eleven point one one percent on us. That is what we're going for, right? You know, there are going to be the stocks like we've pointed out earlier on a week to week basis that we clean up. They're nice and easy. We had that with uh, SoFi, Stitch Fix, Chewy, Roku last week, even the SPX spreads. We take that $1,500 and we move on to the next week. However, there are going to be some that move against us. But, you know, it sounds kind of oversimplified if we put it this way. But if we never lose, we win. And if we apply that to every trade, like with DraftKings, as long as we just make sure that we're not losing, even if it's just making 70 bucks, we're going to win. So that's the goal right here. It's, it's not to get too greedy and say, oh, well, we should have kept it up at 33 to try to collect a little bit more premium on the bounce. No, the idea is, hey, you know, you've had this thing move 11.11% against you in just two short weeks. Don't get greedy. In fact, you should be so thankful that we even have the opportunity uh, to break even. So let's not get greedy with the 33 puts. Let's roll those down to the 32 strike puts. Uh, and in doing that, we were able to capture a little bit more extrinsic value on those. And on a week to week basis, we dropped our break even price on this roll from 33 to 32. Uh, our break even price dropped from 32.43 down to 31.93. And again, you know, our strike is above the break even price. There's still a probability or possibility uh, for profit. And even though it's only $70 of profit, we are not going to get too greedy with this one. If these uh, if these things expire worthless, it runs back above 32, and you're like, oh well, I really liked DraftKings and I only got $70 of profit, you're more than welcome to jump back in and sell some more puts at like 30 or 31 or 32 again and start turning that $70 profit into more and more profit for DraftKings. And that's the idea, right? Because even if you don't like the risk of potentially losing upside if it runs back to 35 or something like that next week, even if it does run back to 35 and these expire worthless, you are more than welcome to jump back in with more 32 strike puts for the following week and just keep playing that stock week after week. And that is the uh, that's the mentality and the game plan that we're going to have with DraftKings. So trying to break even, DraftKings, Palantir, those have moved against us in a super, super big way. So we're just trying to break even on those. And I think we have a decent plan to do so. Obviously, DraftKings is a lot closer to breaking even than Palantir, but as we demonstrated with that basis decrease in Palantir, uh, I still think we are well on the way to getting this one where we need to get it to uh, eventually. Uh, but not to bore you guys too much because, you know, a lot of the explanation for our weekly recap last week where we made 9500 bucks is just the fact that, hey, you know, we kept rolling these positions and they bounced a little bit. So what we have for the upcoming week, let's talk about that. What's our game plan for the next week? And now we have a lot less... Uh, a lot less capital in play, right? We used to be about 170% fully assigned. We got rid of this Rocket Lab position. So we have a little bit more cash to play with. About 43% of our buying power is being used. And while we did open uh, Fubo, SoFi, and Robinhood for the upcoming week, we do have a little bit of cash to play with. I want to play with a little bit of cash next week and open up some more positions. Uh, but, you know, let's talk about our game plan for the week before... Uh, actually, I'm gonna take a sip of water really quickly, and then we are gonna get into it—the good stuff, right? It's it's good to learn from our mistakes, learn from the past weeks, but it's always more fun and exciting to talk about how we're gonna make money this week. All right. So for the upcoming week, before we get into that, some shameless self-promotion here: hourglass-trader.com. Uh, we talk about the trades that we make every single week, right? If you want to get alerts as to when we enter these, when we exit these, and pretty much mimic exactly what we do 
on a week-to-week and day-to-day basis to get these results that we've gotten so far this year. That's an over 100% return. Pop over to hourglass-trader.com. Join HT Premium. What you're going to get from that, you're going to get premium Discord access uh, through the website, right? You'll get uh, trade plans that we'll publish sometimes if we need them. Uh, We have the premium chat room that I'll show you in a second. We have a link to our portfolio tracker, which you had over here. We have a watch list, which I'll be updating soon, and links to our option scanners that we use to uh, identify a lot of these positions, right? If you pop into Thinkorswim, you go to our scan tab, and you go to the option hacker, and you click up here, if it will load at the speed that I talk at. Here we go. And you go to load, scan, query, personal. We've got all these in here that we use to identify decent trade opportunities. If you want to get the link to import those directly into your module, uh, this is the way you do it, HD Premium. And the biggest value of them all is going to come from our premium Discord channel, right? And our premium Discord, excuse me, premium Discord channels within our server. It's always going to be free to join, ask questions, watch the videos, and get one free trade a week. But if you want to be alerted for every single trade we make as we make them, there you go. We've got it in there, right? Chewy, we said December 9th, we sold it for 43. Literally the day later, we bought it for two cents back. And that was $246 of profit overnight. Uh, so these trades are making some decent, decent money. And if you click on HD Premium here, right, uh, the monthly plan is only $24.99 a month. You can get a one-week free trial to see if it's for you. And I think a lot of our members can attest to the fact that even in just the one-week free trial that they were on, uh, they were able to make enough to pay for that. And then some, right? It's only 225 for the entire year. And even just that one trade, just Chewy from last week, uh, made you enough to pay for an entire year. And, you know, that's beside the fact for things like Rocket Lab, where we made 7,800 bucks. Uh, Roku was one where we made about 448 bucks. Sitch Fix was $250 of overnight profit. But again, point being, you're going to get all those alerts for the upcoming week. And I think everything's pretty transparent. We're not really hiding losers, as you can definitely see uh, Definitely see right here. So this is all legitimate if you want to just use the one-week trial to go you know, cross-reference things in our profit tracker to win the timestamps are on the HD Trade channel. You're welcome to do that as well. But uh, these are all 100% legitimate, real trades that anyone has been able to enter into. And I think a lot of people who have followed us have also been able to uh, to enter into them. And shout out to Sleepy Condor in the Twitch chat, the the cosign for HD Premium. And if Sleepy Condor is uh, is loving HD Premium, there's no reason you won't either. But that is where I will end the shameless self promotion. We also have, if you want a free month, right? You can get a free week with the monthly. If you want a free month, though, you can download Weeble and sign up, deposit $100 into our account using a referral link. Send me a screenshot of that, and then I'll get you set up with a free month. But, all right, now that that is over, and I promise that'll be the end of that, uh, back to our regularly scheduled program when we talk about the upcoming week. And like I mentioned, I did open Fubo, SoFi, Robinhood uh, last week, right before the bell on Friday, which that was alerted. But let's take a look at the ideas behind those as well really quickly. So Fubo trading at 1781, and this is one unfortunately where, you know, sometimes I like to wait until right before the bell. I got a little bit antsy on this one because it had already hit 2157 uh, last Thursday. So when it dropped back down to this 18-ish range and dropped even further on Friday to about 1850, I said, okay, you know, I think this is a decent entry point. Uh, but unfortunately, it bled out a little bit more down to 17.5 before bouncing and getting back up near 18-ish. Uh, but again, our max profit point here is going to be $17 for the upcoming week. Uh, and if you take a look at that, we were able to sell it for a 31 cent premium, which means that our break-even price is going to be 16.69. 1669, which if I can hit it right here, eh, close enough. So if we extend both of these drawings to the left, right, the one on the top is going to be our max profit. Bottom is going to be our break-even price. And if we pull that out to the 180-day chart, it lines up very, very nicely with perceived levels of support. One that we saw just back on December 3rd when it bounced off of this 17-ish level. Uh, and again, back in May when it bounced off this level as well. Now, there was a little bit, it's, it's similar to Palantir in the sense that we've got some decent support, but there was a brief period of time where it dropped down to 14-ish, but that was recovered very, very quickly. If we go back to the one year even, uh, we see some some more of that support level back in April of this year. And then in the last calendar year, right, I hated Fubo back up at these levels at 30, 40, and 50, because I think it was pretty clearly overvalued uh, if you took a look at what was going on. But now that it's back in the high teens and we're getting to some areas where there's already been some established levels of support, uh, I think there's some really, really nice opportunity with Fubo right here, especially when we talk about, hey, we really only like to look for anything better than 1% ROR in a week. That's kind of our magic number because that looks really nice on an annual basis. 
uh, if you take a look at that, you could get that 1% ROR down at a 16 strike. Now, we did definitely jump the gun a little bit on the 17 because these things are already up to about 43 cents a piece. But 16 strike is not bad at all. You can get an even better entry than we did. But, you know, with this chart we looked at, this area of max profit and our break-even price and how that lines up with uh, the past year of trading activity for Fubo. And combined with the fact that, you know, they had earnings back at the beginning of November. So you got to get another good month or two before they report earnings again. So no super volatile binary events in the upcoming future. Uh, I think it's a really good opportunity to enter into a trade on that one. So that's why we jumped in on these 17 strike puts. And now let's take a look at SoFi where we sold the 14 strike puts. And it's going to be a lot of the same story, right? Uh, zooming out on the chart to try to see where perceived levels of support are. And on the one year, it's pretty, pretty clear where you can see that support lies, right? Uh, there's a little bit of a candle wake back down here at the beginning of March, which I wouldn't pay too much attention to because that was a pretty big down day uh, in the market where it bounced quickly back up off of that. But again, we see a bounce off of 14.8. Uh, we see a bounce off of 14.2. Uh, up in August, we see a bounce off of 13.8-ish. You know, uh, but point being, if we sell the 14 strike, we plot out 14 on the chart right there. In general, you see a lot of bounces either at or above that level. So if we sell the 14 uh, strike puts, we're pretty much banking on this thing staying above 14. And there's a, there's pretty decent precedent for it to do that. So if we look at the 14 strike puts, there you have it, right? 1.67% ROR. That's above the 1% weekly ROR that we look for. Uh, if you line that up with the MMM, the market maker move here, that would suggest that there's only going to be a 75 cent move in the upcoming week. That would put the low end of the range at 1425, which again is above 14. So we got a lot working for us on this trade, right? We have a stock that's pretty oversold, and we love if you've been following some of the setups that we've been chasing lately. Uh, we love chasing these oversold stocks, right? You see the RSI, which is one of my favorite indicators about short term price action in a stock. It gets down into the blue right here, which means it's below 30. And anytime it kind of gets this low, you could look historically like this is one instance, it bounces back up. Uh, gets back down to 30-ish over here, bounced back up pretty quickly. And now again, we're not quite in the blue because it got in the blue uh, a couple weeks ago and bounced back up. But we're down near this 30 level. So I'm perfectly happy to, uh, you know, kind of lean on RSI a little bit as a solid technical indicator and hope for a little bit of a bounce. And again, it's trading at 15. We sold a 14 strike put. We don't even really need a bounce. We just needed to not drop $1 in the upcoming week, which is really, really solid value proposition. So we're happy with that. We'll lock in 250 bucks of profit on that, you know, 310 off of Fubo. And the, this is how, uh, these nice pronunciation. <laughs> this is how the, uh, strategy that we're going for lines up, right? It's just a bunch of base hits on a week to week basis. If Fubo stays above 17, 310 bucks. If SoFi stays above 14, there you go. Another 250 bucks. And if Robin Hood stays above 18, there you go. 145. And all of a sudden you've got with just these three quick trades that we entered into at the end of the day on Friday, and you just sitting back, not doing anything at all, you could, you know, you can go go to sleep for five straight days. But if these hold the strike prices, we sold that's 700 bucks of profit towards the upcoming week. And again, Robinhood, we haven't talked about yet, but let's take a look at Robinhood because this one's a little bit trickier, but one where if we talk about RSI so much, I think this is a great RSI related opportunity, right? So we saw the SoFi RSI where we said, okay, this thing's down near 30. It's begging for a bounce. Um, if 30 is begging for a bounce, then I don't really know what 21 is on the RSI. This thing is just screaming for, for some sort of short-term recovery. And if you take a look at the last 20 days to get a little bit more context, this thing's gone from 35 down to 20, which is severely, severely, severely oversold. And we're hoping for a little bit of relief at the roundish number of 20. Now, this is a little bit harder because we could point back for SoFi and FUBA. We were able to zoom the chart out, look to the left, and we were able to point to some areas of support historically. Uh, but since Robinhood IPO'd this year uh, back in July at around this 35 level, it's tough to say where this thing is going to stop. So when we don't have any you know, chart indication of when it's going to stop, I think looking at the RSI indication of when it's potentially going to stop is a decent uh, idea here, right? Because the last time RSI was even lower than this was back when it dropped down to 21. And at least for a few days after that, it bounced back up to overall stay relatively flat. But again, we don't care if it keeps dropping. We just need to stay above 18, which we have a decent little cushion for if we go to the five-day chart here. have to zoom out. This is the level we need to stay above for the upcoming week. And now what we did do is because I, you know, talking about being conscious of the amount of buying power that you're using for different positions, 
you know, we don't want to load up off the bat with just, you know, three things right here, just in case the market tanked at the end of the day on Friday. So what we did with this one was I couldn't really decide if I wanted to, you know, open it, not open it. So I figured a good middle ground would be to open about half of the normal position for me right there. So that's just selling five of those. So I sold this for 29 cents a piece and it looks like it was a good decision because it really tapered off at the end of the day. And now what I'll be able to do Monday morning is sell the other half of these potentially for about 36, 37 uh, cents a piece. And again, if we want to take a look at that ROR metric, we've got a 1.13% ROR even at the 17 strike. And that's a $3 cushion, which is about a 15% cushion. And you know the way to think about that is, hey, if you sell 10 of these, that's really nice as one, you don't need the entire amount fully cash secured. You get a little bit of help on the margin side of things, but you'll hit basically $180 of profit on this trade just as long as Robinhood doesn't drop 15%. And I think that is a very, very decent value proposition, especially when, again, you take a look at this MMM, suggests a range of about $1.54 for the upcoming week, which will put the lower end of the expected range at about $18.50 which is above our strike of 18 and above your potential strike of 17 if you decide to enter into this trade uh, tomorrow morning when the market opens. So that's what we're into for the upcoming week. That, uh, you know, Fubo, SoFi, Robinhood, you know, those are the ones that we've opened uh, Friday, yesterday, not yesterday, Friday afternoon for the upcoming week because we always like to take a little bit of advantage of that weekend theta decay because uh, it definitely does exist and is slightly more significant than the night to night data decay. So I like entering into positions on Friday afternoons. But again, you know, you'll look at the list here. This is still a lot shorter than what our list typically gets to on a normal week, right? I mean, looking back at the beginning of November, we've got a lot of trades that we get into, especially with the little new indicator that we throw here in column G. A lot of activity that we have on a day to day basis in the market. We make a lot of our money in the market off that, right? If we go back to before we had the little Palantir disaster and we had to manage that a little bit, even if you just look at the new trades from 1114, there you go, 775 bucks. If you take a look at the new trades here, 500 bucks, and that's with a $970 loss mixed in there. Uh, the week before that, right, $2,500 just off the new trades. A week before that, I, I don't know how this is going to end up. There we go, 1300 bucks off the new trades. And I'll do one more just to prove the point, but like uh, these are SPX spreads that were to hedge, but the non-hedged positions, 2,400 bucks. So the idea here is that, you know, while we do like to have some positions going into the week, because we in general want to be long on the market and have something going at all times, a lot of the value in what we do comes on a day-to-day -day basis and how we react to what happens in the market. But, you know, obviously we can't figure that out right now. So let's try to get some more trade ideas that we could potentially enter into uh, come Monday morning. And again, the best place that we're going to look to do that is going to be on the scanner. And now that I think about that really quickly, one other area that is super, super helpful are earnings trades, right? And if you can't really find a lot of premium in the market, volatility is going down. There's always places you could find volatility to kind of create that opportunity for an option seller. One of those places is going to be earnings. And if I pop over into our Discord server here really quickly, again, if it hurries up and uh, loads, we talk a little bit about earnings trades in here, right? And one from last week that I want to highlight on the list that we had, not to get too far back into the recap from last week, but Chewy is one that I really, really liked the way that it's set up. Now, Chewy online, you know, pet company, uh, they, I guess ship pet food to your door and other items. I don't really have an opinion on the company, but what I do have an opinion on is the numbers, the premium that we get and the way that these things set up. So let's take a look at what we were looking at uh, pre-earnings, right? And it was actually called out in our Discord server. Shout out to, I think it was, Mike. there we go, Mike B in the Discord server. Don't know if you're on the stream right now, but I'm giving you a shout out because you called this one out and made everyone a little bit of money with it. So the reporting earnings, right? We saw that there was a little bit of a downtrend, but more impressively, the great part about Chewy is that if you pull the chart up here, C-H-W-Y, and go right before, let's do the 20 day here. This is basically what we were looking at before earnings. And if you looked at the option chain, we're not going to be able to do that now because the opportunity is coming gone. But we love to look for that 1% ROR. If you take a look or took a look, the 40 strike puts here, which an insane, insane, insane cushion. These were offering the 1% uh, ROR that we we're going for. And you can see that we talked a little bit about it right here. ROR just over 1%. We took a look at it. RSI was a little bit lower, indicating it's oversold. We liked the way the 40 puts sold up. You know, carbon was with us. I like it. 
Uh, and again, we uh, figured it was pretty solid. You got some decent leverage on it. It was a 10% ROC, which is nuts, right? We love the 1% ROR for a one week period. Uh, and when these things are these overnight earnings trades, especially the Thursday night ones where you basically have to hold on to the position for about 12 hours, uh, a 1% ROR for 12 hours is fantastic as compared to 1% for a full five trading day. So that's why we really do love the uh, the earnings trades towards the end of the week because there's a really short turnaround time where one, theta decay at the end of the week is entirely exponential and is more rapid than ever before. And two, uh, the drop-off and premium from the drop-off of implied volatility post-earnings uh, those two factors really work well together to crush the option premium. That's exactly what happened. So we were looking at a chart like this, where the expected move, I think, was about eight bucks, which will get it down to about, you know, 48 ish. And our strike at 40, which gave us the return that we were looking for, was uh, double that down at 40. Oh, KB is Mike B. Honestly, I had no idea of that until now. What a reveal in the chat. But uh, shout out to Mike B or KB for the uh, for the recommendation right there. But again, we talk about MMM, which uh, we looked at pre-earnings. That got us down to an expected move of 48, which gave us even more confidence that this strike way out of the money down at 40 was even better. And if we scroll forward, yes, there was a big red candle post-earnings, but you know it never even got below $50 a share, which was an additional $10 cushion uh, from where what we sold was at. So I guess point being is if you're not able to find uh, opportunities in the scanner that we're about to look at, there are always plenty of other places to look uh, for decent premium in the market. And earnings is a great example of that. This is one that had a really great setup that we like to look for. This is an example of what we were seeing, what we saw, and, and why we liked what we saw to give us this trade where we were able to sell these things for 43 cents. Where to go? Where to go? Right here. And then the following morning, so less than 12 hours later, close them out for two cents a piece and lock in $246 of profit right there. But again, that was one base hit in a number of base hits throughout the week that came together to uh, to make the solid week that we had. So it's not you're not going to get it all in one trade. And if you're getting it all in one trade, uh, maybe rethink what you're doing because your diversification might not be the best or you're probably doing something a little bit riskier. <clears throat> but, you know, it doesn't take a lot to identify an opportunity like this. I think if you look at the chat we had, there aren't timestamps, but I think this discussion was no more than about 10 to 15 minutes. So it's not too tough to actually, you know, have an opportunity to come across, figure out if it's a good setup or not. But, you know, a lot of these things that we see, like that earnings opportunity on a day-to-day -day basis, really power us to a lot of these winning weeks that we've been having and the winning year overall that we've been having. So how are we going to do that for the upcoming week? We talked about Fubo. We talked about SoFi. We talked about Robinhood. Let's go finally, after I, you know, talk in circles and go on little tangents here, let's finally go to the scanner. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, we've got the sand, the scan set up right here. It's pulling, uh, you know, puts with high return on risk. ROR is that number we like to look for. And again, if you want to get that loaded into your thinkorswim module, we've got the link for that through our website, hourglass-trader.com. <clears throat> Excuse me, something in my throat. All right. So as you can see at the top of the list, right, we only look for a 1% ROR, but you know, it's fun to just put these things at the top because just because you see something at 15% ROR doesn't mean it's necessarily too risky, right? You could take a look at BKKT. Oops. Yeah, there it is. BKKT, which has, you know, the 15% ROR number basically at the money. But, you know, you might say 15% ROR, that's a pretty crazy number. And I would agree with you. I definitely would not sell the 15 strike puts here. But what you could do is say, hey, you know, if this has so much premium at the money, why don't I keep looking a little bit further out of the money? And then you start to get yourself into a position where, hey, you know, I can get this 1% ROR number that we like so much at a 10 strike, which is basically 33% downside for the upcoming week. So if you look at the, we're at the 20 day chart here, you can put, sell your, set yourself up with the trade that says, hey, you know, I have a max profit point of right here. And as long as it holds above this red line for the next five days, which, you know, it's been holding above that pretty well so far historically. Uh, I'm going to pull that 1% ROR. Now, BKKT is a crypto-ish former SPAC-related stock, and those are two things that I try to stay away from. So sticking to my personal rules, but that doesn't mean that you can't see a setup like that. Say, hey, you know, I like the company. I like the crypto space. I'm not scared of those former SPACs, and, and this is the 1% ROR that I'm going for. That's perfectly valid, right? I, I think I always try to say that 
you know, it's not so much important that we agree on the thesis that I have for every single trade, but I think we should agree on the method uh, with which we play that thesis. And that's targeting these, you know, more modest returns via option selling for out of the money puts that give you nice cushions uh, for your trades. Uh, but back to the scanner again, because BKK is uh, BKKT is not quite my cup of tea. AMC, obviously, for the same types of reason, uh, or not, you know, it's one of these things that's really, really elevated, even after it's pulled back a little bit to 2744. If we zoom out to the scheme of things here, you know, unless it got back to this 10 ish level, uh, I'm not the biggest fan. It's actually at a pretty critical point right here. It looks like 29 ish was previous support, and there's some pretty big candles between uh, uh, 27 and 14. But again, number one golden rule when we're selling options is never sell options on something that you would not personally want to take assignment of. And AMC is definitely something I would not want to take assignment of. So I stay away from that one. And you're going to see that that theme fits a lot of the stocks that we see at the very, very top of the list. Because the things that offer the most ROR are consequently the uh, the riskiest stocks out there. That's why the option premium is so high. Uh, CEI is kind of interesting. That's one that we played a little bit before. When it ran up to about a buck fifty, but now it's at a dollar ten, and you're in a position where, hey, you know, again, one of these things I don't love because there's some pretty glaring downside there for the immediate future. But if we go to like the ten day or something like that, you'll see that it's held at the one dollar ish level pretty decently for the last couple of weeks. Uh, if we take a look at the trade tab, you'll see that you could get okay, it's not nearly as good as what the scanner said. Hold on, scanner said this thing was pulling seven cents seven to ten cents of premium for the one strike put uh here is the reason why we're looking at december 23rd i need to knock this down to five oops let me put it up to six okay 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 there we go nice little still december 23rd i know what i did wrong this is what needed to be knocked down Bear with me as I, you know, I swear I've done this before, right? I was, because uh, one of the things we talk about so much are the stocks that only have options with monthly expiries. So sometimes I'll play with the uh, days to expiry to try to pull those into the scan as well. And December 17th is a, is a monthly expiry. But okay, here we go. Now we've got the real list of what we were really trying to get down to. Uh, C-A-L-T, this looks insane, a 42% ROR. What is going on? I mean, we might as well just look at this one because it just looks so interesting. C-A-L-T. I can almost guarantee you that I'm probably not going to invest in this. But, you know, I'm kind of curious. A 15 strike put offering four-ish dollars of premium. Let's see what the volume is looking like on that. It's 84, not a ton of volume, right? There's only, looks like 130 contracts traded based on those option statistics. So not a lot of liquidity in that. But... Uh, I think it's a pretty big biotech company that has some upcoming news. If we go to that news tab, we're going to see, there you go, the week ahead in biotech, FDA decision for Caliditas. I'm sure I really butchered that pronunciation there, but that's the idea, right? They've got an FDA decision coming up. Biotech has these incredibly binary events where, especially if a company has one or two drugs in their pipeline and one drug gets you know axed by the FDA, there goes an insane amount of uh, potential revenue from the pipeline and the value of the stock gets crushed as well. And a lot of the time, the value uh, you know, behind the drops in those moves far outpaces what we're able to do from an option selling perspective. So these are setups that I typically stay away from because we get questions a lot, right? Because if you go to the scan, you sort it, right? This is the top of the scan. Of course, this is gonna be the first thing a lot of people are looking at. But people are gonna say, hey, you know, a 15 strike put for four bucks, I can have an $11 break even price, which looks okay on paper, right? It would take a 50% ish drop for you to lose money. But you know, biotech is a lot different. Like let's take a look at FBRX. This is one where we got a lot of the same questions and basically gave people the same advice like, hey, stay away from this one. Like I know over the past year, it's been trading between 25 and 43, but a bad result, which is what happened here. Uh, can make you wish you had never touched these at all in the first place. And this thing went from 29 down below five bucks to where it's settled today at 233 a share. So if you take a look at a drop like this from 29 down to four in the context of CALT, you know, that's really, it would not take a lot to crush you with an $11 break even price. That's why we try to stay away from those. But again, it's always kind of fun to look at those because 
some of the craziest premium you'll see on a week-to-week basis. 42 is just an absolutely enormous, enormous number. And I think BLU is in a similar situation because that was one that popped up last week that, uh, excuse me, that I was taking a look at. So you can sell the 2.5 strike puts here, interestingly enough. You get a 7.53% ROR. That would set you up with about a 230 break even price. And that is a price that, you know, it hasn't been at before. And I've got the hiccups live on stream here, so excuse me. Uh, bear with me. I'm, you know, hit the hit the 10 o'clock Eastern hour and I'm losing it. Someone needs to scare me. If this went red really quickly, I think that would solve the hiccup problem. But uh, yeah, so idea here with the 2.5 strike, you'd be set up with about a 230 break even, which... You know, looking at the chart looks good, but if you go to the three-year, I think, there you go. They've been out of 201 before. They've had similar really large drops going down from 9 to uh, 280, and I'd imagine there's only so much premium in these because, there you go, ahead of data readout. They've got another event coming up, and I don't know too much about the company. Similar with CALT, I'm just not going to get in the way of that one. Why put yourself in an unnecessarily risky position? I'm not going to do that. Uh, going a little bit further down the list here, and it really is the similar story with a lot of these near the top. They're either biotech or these crazy like DWAC, AMC type stocks that just have a super volatile event or something like that coming up. So I, I find it helpful almost to just go down to the range that we like to trade in, right? We only like to target about a 1% ROR. So if we start getting into this two range and start looking at tickers that we might recognize, like there you go, DocuSign, a 140 strike put. Let's take a look at DocuSign for the upcoming week. This thing had earnings. Uh, the earnings did not go great. It's bounced off of 130. So it could be some perceived support. If we look at the 130 level, that's about a 0.6% ROR. Uh, 135 gets us to the number that we're going for, right? With the 1.13% ROR, uh, which is decent. But if we got in at 135 for, let's see how much that's offering, a buck 40, that puts our break even at 133.50. It's going to be here, 133.50. We'll call it right there. Extend to the left. If I can right click it properly, there you go, extend it to the left. And while that is kind of near the lower end of the range for the drop that I had recently, what scares me a little bit more is, you know, what happens if this thing goes back below 131? They lowered their revenue guidance uh, for the coming months, which means that, you know, there's not a hugely bullish outlook. If we go to the three year chart on this one, it still has run up a ton from where it was trading at, you know, pre COVID when it started to become very, very necessary. And while DocuSign is one of the bigger names, uh, I tend to think a lot of these COVID companies, DocuSign is really similar to what I think about, you know, Peloton, where they had these big run-ups and, you know, best case scenario, as, as crazy it is to say for companies like Peloton, companies like Zoom, like a worldwide pandemic where people are forced to work and live from home is pretty much the best thing that could happen to a lot of these companies. So, you know, there really is only one way to go from these COVID peaks. And I feel like DocuSign, that had a covid induced peak and we're not quite at the bottom yet i think i could see some downside to the 90 ish area but uh you know it, it could also bounce back up to 180 like none of this ever happened but in exchange for you know one percent in a questionable area questionable meaning it's you know right near the bottom of these but there isn't another easily identified area of support beyond that uh, that's one that i would tend to stay away from but again We've got 1,374 different results on this thing. So let's keep uh, scrolling and see if we see anything interesting. There you go. CRSP, that's a stock that we love, actually. So that's one that we're already in on. We are not in on this thing already. Uh, one that offers some really, really nice returns. You can sell a 67 uh, strike put on this one, and that would give you a 1% ROR. 67 strike put would give you about a 66-ish break-even price. And this is one where we're starting to run into, you know, the issue with DocuSign was it's falling back down. We don't know which is going to stop because there wasn't a lot of support and resistance in the range that it was falling in. Uh, with CRISPR, we're starting to get back into this range, right? We can see a level of support uh, right around here if we draw that where it bounced off of back in June at about the 60 level. Uh, but even above that, there was a decent level at around, let's see, 75 where it's kind of lurking in that range right here. It bounced off of roughly 67, 68-ish. And that kind of lines up with where it bounced off of back in June. You know, nothing super, super clear cut. Uh, but leaning on that RSI indicator, again, it's down in the blue. It is pretty much taking a straight line down from 124 to where it's sitting out at 73 right now. 
So, uh, you know, I'm at least expecting some sort of short-term bounce on this one, and I think it's a definitely a good entry. And one that, you know, it is in the biotech-ish space, but, you know, golden rule of selling options is never sell options on something that you don't want to potentially own. And I think it's a very interesting company. They're involved with a lot of the gene editing type technologies. And I think just those futuristic type companies are always so interesting to me because, you know, it's not like tomorrow news is going to be released that gene editing isn't feasible, right? There's already been a lot of studies and things of that nature that point to that uh, being something potentially viable in the future. So as, as long as there's some sort of decent future outlook, there's going to be some sort of valuation tied up in that. I think space companies are very similar in that sense. And I, that's why I like to target those futuristic like companies and CRISPR fits the bill for that. So decent one to enter if you're not already in on that. We are already in on that one. Uh, let's keep kind of moving down the list here. JMIA, this is one that we recognize from our watch list. And it has had a huge, huge, huge drop. Now, this one is a little bit tougher, right? Because back in April of 2020, this thing got down to 215 a piece. And we always say that we like to avoid those setups where there's some pretty big potential downside up there. And I think the next level of support that we could see is probably around uh, where it bounced off of back in September. Because I don't know if I really see anything at this level, maybe at the 10 level, if we draw the line right here at 10. Uh, you know, the bottoms of these candle wicks from August to September of 2019 bounced off those. Uh, but, you know, there really isn't a lot other than that, other than the fact that, you know, 10 is a psychologically round number that a lot of people set buys and sells at. So you could see a little bit of chop in that area before it moves lower. But if you did want to sell some, yeah, I don't know, 11 strike puts, those aren't a massive ROR, especially for how fast this thing could move. But if you like the way the numbers stack up, right, you could sell a 12 strike or 11.5 strike put even, which gives you a $1.50 cushion uh, on a stock where the market maker move is really implied at 36 cents. So the, a big alpha right there in the favor of the option sellers at 11.5 strikes. So that's a decent potential opportunity for the upcoming week. Uh, moving down further here. And another thing we like to do is target some of these lower strikes because lower strikes, I know from a fundamental valuation perspective, if a stock is cheaper, that doesn't actually mean it's worth less. But I do think it is you know, not worth ignoring uh, the psychological impact that cheaper stocks have on investors. So we've got three that we see right here, Curve, Cold, and YMM. Let's take a look at Curve. C-U-R-V. Torrid Holdings, it looks to be, I mean, that sounds very SPAC-ish to me. I don't know if I can confirm those suspicions, but oh, probably not SPAC-ish. It looks like it went from 33 back down to 10. Uh, bad earnings, looks like. Oversold RSI, I mean, this thing's begging for an entry. This is about as good of an entry as we've seen on this thing in the last uh, 180 days. And you'll notice back from August to uh, September, right, there's all these red, red, red candles. This might remind you of what we've seen with Palantir, with what we've seen with DraftKings. And again, we don't need all these red candles to be preceded by a run back up to where it previously was. But even just the bounce that we've seen right here, where it bounces back up for even just a week at a time in a big way, that's enough for us to break even on this trade. So when we have setups like this, where RSI gets down into the blue, and then the stock spikes back up, that is what we're targeting. But again, back to the matter at hand, back to Torrid Holdings. I don't really know what it is. So the first thing you do when you don't know what a stock is, you go to the Analyze tab, you go to Fundamentals, you type in C-U-R-V, and there you have it. Torrid Holdings, a direct to consumer brand of women's plus size apparel and intimates in North America. All right. So, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but after Thanksgiving holiday season coming up, the plus size apparel might be uh, might be a decent option if anyone's lifestyle out there has been as lazy as mine has been for the past uh, the past few weeks. Uh, but decent entry point if you're looking at selling options. There's only monthly options here, so that's definitely a consideration you should probably have in mind. Uh, doesn't look like they have any volatile events coming up because earnings were just announced uh, about last week. Let's see if there's any news on how those earnings looked. So there you go. Another good thing to look at when you see these big drop is hey, you know. Where could I potentially expect this to go up to? And while we can only look at this for maybe four or five minutes on a Sunday night stream, uh, analyst price targets are also a very interesting place to look, right? So they got downgraded uh, to equal weight from overweight, overweight, which still means that they're okay with holding it. Uh, but the bigger news here is that the price target was cut down to 14 from 28. But again, you know, if we sell 10 strike puts, we just need the thing to stay above 10. And the bankers are basically saying, hey, we think 14 is a good target. So you've got that on your side. I don't know if I see any other price target information. It looks like they 
were issued sales guidance below estimates. So they lowered guidance. Uh, nothing else too crazy, I think, in here. There we go. Goldman lowered price target to 23. That was back in October, though, so not really as recent as this Morgan Stanley thing. Uh, but again, you know, I think decent has decent makings for an entry for the upcoming week, right? Especially at this 10 strike. So if you wanted to knock in here, say, hey, I'm going to try to get 20 cents for this, set the limit order, put it out there. We like to say if it fills, it fills. Uh, and another great thing here, right, is, you know, if we wanted to sell 10 of these, that would take $9,800. But with margin, uh, it would only take a thousand bucks. So while this is a 2% ROR, $200 of profit on $1,000 of buying power is actually a 20% return on capital. And that is not too bad at all. And especially with these stocks that only have monthly expiries, uh, one great way to do it is to look at, you know, not just step one where we say, hey, if we sell a 10 strike put for 20 cents, we're going to have a 980 break even price, but also potentially look at step two, right? Because if we get assigned on these with a 980 break even price, where can we go from there? And the answer is to look for the following month, uh, you know, at around the money call premium. So while 10 is still in the money by a buck 30, 12.5 is a little bit out of the money, we could estimate that maybe at the money call premium will be somewhere, you know, in a middle ground between two bucks and a dollar. So we can call it about a dollar 50. So we could say, hey, if we're assigned, we would be assigned with a 980 basis. But if we were able to sell like a 10 strike call for a dollar 50, we would then be in on the position with a you know, 980 minus 150 to give you an 830 basis with upside to $10, which is, you know, a $1.70 profit on 830 of premium, which is about 25%. Uh, it's under 25%, but uh, the, for full disclosure, the calculator app on my computer isn't working for some reason, and I'm not a savant. So it's somewhere around a 20% return, even if it drops down to this $10 level. And again, we've got this Morgan Stanley price target, which is telling us, you know, 14 is potentially a reasonable expectation for a bounce. We've got RSI, which is begging for a bounce. And really one of the better entries you'll see over the last 180 days. And while this is something that has just come across to us just from looking at our scan results, I love the idea of the CURV, the curve, uh, 10 strike puts for the upcoming week. So I'm gonna go throw this out here to the right in our little, you know, makeshift watch list for the upcoming week curve 10 strike puts and again we saw three different stocks that were at 10 strike where were the other two kold and then ymm let's take a look at those kold come on come on come on please let me type okay this is a ultra share gas etf okay i am not going to be touching that any sort of you know natural gas because one that's just inherently volatile we're looking at the 180 day chart where it's gone from 43 to 5 to 11 that's a little bit too much for me. And I'm sure if we zoom out even further to like the three year, there you go. So one of those things where there is a lot more volatility than our option selling strategies can potentially prepare us for. And there's some established downside to the $6 level already. So I don't know if a $10 strike is something I really want to start with off the bat here. So I'm going to stay away from that one. But again, 1300 different results on this thing. So let's go right back into it and see what we got. The third of those was going to be YMM. YMM. Full Truck Alliance Company. All right, I've never heard of this in my life. Let's go to the 180 day. Looks like it's gone from 22 to 8 to 11. Okay, so this one's a little bit better because we could see that, hey, you know, there's some established support here right around the $10 level. You see a bounce off it on December 6th. You see another bounce uh, back on December, what, 10th, last Friday. And you see it bounce off it back in August. Now it did get down to this 950 ish level. Uh, back in the end of July, but you know, there's some decently perceived support at this point. RSI isn't as great from an entry perspective as we saw with uh, CURV, but that's also because there was just a huge green candle at the back end of last week. But nevertheless, let's take a look at that 10 strike put. And again, it's one where you can get that 20 cents of premium. Now, this scares me a little bit because there is a ton of volume on the 7.5 strike puts, which is really, really strange. There's an enormous amount of volume on the 12 and 15 strike calls, despite pretty much having no other option volume. That's really, really strange. Uh, so I guess what I might need to do next is take a look at the news and see what the deal was back in one. Did it IPO? Okay. MW China is cracking. Okay. So it looks like this is a Chinese stock. I guess step one should have been going here. And typing in YMM, Full Truck Alliance Co. There you go, centered in China. And general rule for our investing strategy is we like to avoid uh, Chinese stocks because they are typically insanely, insanely volatile. 
and kind of at, have some super, super big regulatory risk that they carry along with them. So again, to the point we tried to make earlier, there's no need to take on more risk than necessary. If there's Chinese regulatory risk that we can avoid, we're going to avoid that. So we're going to stay away from this and the fact that, you know, with RSI at 54 and it was up 15% on Friday, not the greatest entry as compared to curve where RSI is down in the blue right here, relatively flat day on Friday. So I think the entry point is much, much better. And so that's kind of the difference, in, even though we had three different stocks that had 10 strike puts that were offering similar ROR, you know, that's identical ROR, to be honest. Uh, you know, that is kind of the thought process that we like to go through right there when we evaluate those. Now, OPAD, this is a really interesting one because it was a former SPAC. We don't like to play the former SPACs above 10 because they could fall back below 10 so quickly. Uh, OPAD is a great example of that, right? It spiked up to 20-ish back in whenever this was, I think September, right? Came back down to 10 and it hung around these, uh, you know, this seven to eight level right here. And this is an interesting company, right? It's in a similar area as Zillow, as Open Door, two names that I, I really like the industry of. So anytime we see some decent premiums on these things in which, uh, you know, 50 cents of premium on a 7.5 strike put is very, very nice. That would give you a $7 break even price, which falls right here. And I could take these lines away that I have some previous analysis at some point. Remove drawing, remove drawing. Let's go back to the 180 there right here. Oops, I was zoomed in. 180 day. Okay. And if you extend that out to the left, you'll see $7 while it was briefly below that at the beginning of December, uh, at the very least, it's a decent starting point, right? We, even if step one doesn't go great for us and we get assigned with the seven strike basis, let's think about step two, right? Where we could potentially sell an at the money call for, you know, this might be a little bit elevated, but maybe 70 cents. And then from there, we would have shares that we were assigned with the $7 basis. We knock 70 cents off that basis. And all of a sudden we're sitting with shares uh, at a 630 basis, which lines up with the low that the stock has ever traded at. And that has upside of about a dollar and 20 to that 7.5 strike that we would sell. So that's the idea right there. Step one, if it works, awesome. We're going to pull a 7.53% ROR. That is a insane, insane number. Oh, excuse me. There you go. 2.04%. I was going to say that didn't seem correct, but okay. That looks a lot different now. You're not going to have a seven basis. You're going to have a 735 basis. Okay. The words were coming out of my mouth and they weren't, and they weren't quite making sense. But, uh, you know, looking at that back, that makes more sense. You would get a 735 basis if you sold for 15 cents. And then from there, you could lower that by about 80 cents and that would get you down to about 650. But again, 650, not a bad place to be on this, uh, on this stock. So I wouldn't hate the idea of selling some offer pad, uh, 7.5 strike puts for 15 cents if you can. We mentioned those are similar to Open Door. We've actually got shares on these, which we were assigned, interestingly uh, interestingly enough. So what happened with Open Door? we get this question a lot too, because it's kind of interesting because a lot of people don't really hold options until expiry, especially when they're kind of near. It's definitely the quote unquote safe idea uh, to close these things out. But with Open Door, the 15 strike puts that we sold were really running down to the wire. So what we did is we said, hey, you know, we're just going to hold on to these and see what happens. And if you go to the one day chart, you'll see it was trading around 1480. And at the end of the day, our max profit point of 15 right here, it got back above it. And then at 359 at the final minute before it closed, it dropped down to 1497. So at 1497, you know, that's below 15. So if you had those puts, you're going to exercise those because you would benefit from the extra three cents right here. But interestingly enough, after hours, you can see by the bid and the ask right here. I don't know if you can. That's actually very, very small text, but it got up to about $15.09. So the great part here is that one, uh, our options were exercised, right? So we're going to collect the entire amount of premium. We got that $1,500 of premium up front from those last week. And now what we have right here in our tracker for the upcoming week is now we have 1,500 shares. And I should probably, not 1,500, we have 1,000. Sorry, we sold 10 of these 15 strikes. So we now were assigned 1,000 shares at a 15 strike. But the great part is, you know, this jumped up to 1,508 after hours. And I have the wrong formula in there clearly because we did not make $8,000, but I think we made about 80 bucks from the eight cent increase. And if this thing went up to like 1550 or anything above 50, we're going to make even more than max profit. So if you're ever in a situation where things are kind of on the edge, you're okay to let things expire, take the shares because while it could go down, yeah, I mean, it's also equally likely that it goes up. 
And sometimes when you're trying to get a fill at the end of the day, you sacrifice a few cents of extrinsic value when you're trying to just close that position out. And that's something that extrinsic value you'll fully get if you're one, letting that expire worthless or two, getting assigned. So there's not, I mean, there is a little bit of risk there, obviously, uh, but you know, it's nothing too, too crazy. We've got KB with a question in the YouTube chat saying, should we be hesitant to open new positions this week with the Fed meeting? And one of those things where I think going into the week, definitely good to have your eye on for the upcoming week, but we always want to have some sort of positions. Now I'm using, oh boy, I've messed this up. <laughs> I'm just going to zero that out for now. But I'm using a little bit over 40% of my buying power heading into the upcoming week. So a little bit less than half. So with that extra half, you know, the idea is if Palantir DraftKings continues to move against us, we could further manage the position. But two, uh, we want to use that buying power to act on the things that we see during the week, the, the activity that ends us up with so many of these new positions that we see on a week to week basis. So that's what we want to keep a lot of buying power for. But you know, if, if Monday or Tuesday, something's happening, and you're saying, okay, I want to enter into this position, just keep that in the back of your mind, right? Because if it goes down, one, the positions you open are going to get crushed. Uh, but two, you know, if it goes down, having that cash on the sidelines means that, you know, while you're getting crushed on what you currently have, you know, you now have much better entries with that cash for other positions. And you might say, well, uh, you know, what if it goes up? I don't want to miss those entries. If it goes up, guess what? You've got this portfolio pull full of positions, which are going to benefit if the market goes up. So it's kind of a win-win the way I look at it, because there's really only two things that could happen. If it goes up after the Fed meeting, good news for us, the positions that we have right now are going to make money. Uh, if things go down after the Fed meeting, you know, it sucks that these positions that we hold uh, are going to lose money temporarily, but we know how to manage those positions. And two, we've got enough cash on the sidelines to take advantage of those new entries if the market does drop. So that's kind of the game plan for this upcoming week. That's what we've got. We're using a little bit less than half of our buying power for the upcoming week. Uh, curve 10 strike puts look pretty interesting from the scan. We're not going to have time to go too much further into the scan, but you know, there's thousands of results in here, not thousands, there's 1300. Uh, there's tens of results in here, hundreds of results in here, I should say, uh, if you want to take a look at those for yourself. Uh, and again, you could use that scanner by getting it from the link on our website, hourglass trader.com. And I'll probably make a post with some of these higher returning puts a little bit later to get some more activity going on the blog. We've uh, been very busy. I'm actually in the process of switching jobs, which is why I've been very, very, uh, uh, there has not been as much content coming out from our side, but good news that uh, if I do get the job switch figured out, some good news is that I will finally be uh, using the webcam on the stream. So we're going to have a nice face reveal. You know, my face is going to be posted up right in the corner right here. Uh, you might see it in some videos, but I figured that might be a decent addition to the uh, stream. So if I get that figured out, that'll be the promise. We'll get started with the uh, with the webcam for streams in the uh, in the next month or so which I know is something we've had some requests for in the chat, but uh, now I think is the time to put that into play. But again, uh, you know, summarizing last week, we pulled $9,500. It was an awesome week objectively, but a lot of that was because we were playing, giving ourselves position and room for the bounce from the big losing week that we had in December. Uh, but, you know, main, main picture that we want to point out is that, look, you know, even with the second worst week that we've had all year, we are now only a couple positions away from entirely recovering that loss. Like this never even happened, right? And that's the great part about our, uh, our strategy. All the losses are temporary. We just got to stick with the plan, make sure that you have enough buying power to leave yourself flexibility to stick with the plan and just keep you know, chipping away at that basis on a week to week basis. I was going to try to avoid using the same word basis and basis, but I couldn't come up with another one. So uh, chipping away at that basis on a week to week basis. Uh, goal for us right now is to get December back green because we obviously made some mistakes uh, on the front end for this week, right? Or for the beginning of December. You don't just do everything well and then lose money, you lose 6.5% on a week, right? Now, the market was red. That's no excuse for us, though. I think the issue is we got a little bit over leveraged into some positions off the bat where things like DraftKings was, you know, 20% of our account off the bat where normally we'd like to open about 10% off the bat. Uh, we got a little bit crazy with Palantir where we, you know, loaded up about 25%. But, uh, you know, we, we, we learned from that going forward. We're not perfect, but I think in general we do a pretty good job. And we're going to keep those uh, we're gonna keep those lessons in the back of our mind moving forward. But goal is going to be getting this thing green in December. And I think we are well positioned uh, to do so for the upcoming week. So thank you to those of you who have tuned in tonight uh, after our one-week hiatus from the stream. 
Uh, we are going to sign off here with our cheesy little saying. Uh, thank you for watching. This has been Hourglass Trader, where as time passes, we make money, and hopefully we'll see you guys again same time next week with more money than you have right now. And hopefully uh, when we see you guys next week, uh, this number up here is going to be green so it can match the rest of them for the year of 2021. But again, thank you guys so much. Hopefully we'll see you in the Discord server this week, hourglass-trader.com for HD Premium to sign up if you haven't and you want to take that option selling strategy to the next level. I think we got a lot of value there. But that is, uh, that's all I've got. So hopefully I'll see you guys again at this time next week. Thank you.